Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's really a pleasure uh, to welcome you to this evening, uh, which kind of culminates a series of events we've been having uh, titled Yoga Week with two wonderful scholars with us. Uh, to begin, I want to introduce um, a very important person, uh, Swami Yogatmananda Ji, who is the uh, presiding person at the Vedanta Society right on Angel Street. He also has affiliation here at Brown in the Office of the Chaplains. And, uh, well, not to say anything except uh, Swamiji has, uh, uh, even in my own life, been a, a great uh, teacher and someone I go to for guidance. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge of uh, not only Vedanta, but many other uh, philosophical uh, schools and religious traditions of India. So it's a pleasure to have him here with us, and he'll be introducing the lecture series that we're here for tonight. So, Swamiji, thank you. Thank you, dear Srinivas. I had told him while introducing, don't say anything bad about me. So he <laughs> said, I won't tell anything that I know. <laughs> um, Atma me shudhyantam Jyotiraham Viraja vipapma Bhuya sagam swaha Um Antaratma me shudhyantam Jyotiraham viraja vipapma bhūya sagam svāha Om paramātmā me shudhyantāṁ Jyotiraham viraja vipapma bhūya sagam svāha Om shānti shānti Shanti. May all layers of my personality become completely purified and let my divine effulgent nature manifest. Dear friends, very happy to introduce this 15th annual Mary Interlandi Memorial Lecture. As we begin, may I ask you to join me to extend a primary and enthusiastic welcome to Mary's parents, John and Beth Interlandi, who are here with us tonight. <laughs> Their presence and their extraordinary generosity to this evening's lecture possible is uh, an important strength for the university community. Please join me to thank them. The chaplain of the university, the Reverend Janet Cooper Nelson, regrets that a prior speaking engagement prevents her from uh, being with us tonight. She asked me to do that job for her this evening. And it is a particular honor to extend an official welcome from the office of chaplain to our two distinguished scholars Professor Marinson and Professor Singleton, who are busily in residence at Providence this week. The annual Mary Interlandi and Zero Phi Memorial Lecture Honors are an amazing young woman whose family encouraged her broad vision, both intellectual and soulful. Mary loved African drumming dance, theater, art, and poetry. At 17, she traveled for six weeks in Nepal, hiking to and living with a family where she worked to help 
building a school and teaching its students and becoming deeply, if briefly, engaged with Nepali people. She fell in love with the culture and the experience changed the course of her life. These uh, passions illumined her time at Brown where she studied Buddhism, feminist theory and Eastern philosophy until her untimely demise uh, at age 19 and half in 2003. The original memorial fund formed shortly after her death grew to become a permanent endowment housed in the office of chaplains with capacity to provide for an annual residency and lecture focused on contemplative and meditative practices. This fund that lovingly bears Mary's name celebrates the life of a student who embraced and embodied the very best of what the university stands for intellectually, spiritually, ethically and socially. Her family's choice to respond to their profound grief by establishing fund brings both conceptual and practical depth to her understanding of contemplative practice and Brown is truly better for it. It will be great to have always the spiritual component to support all the academic uh, endeavors that go on in the university and this lecture series goes uh, to support it in long way. Uh, I express on behalf of everyone my gratitude to the Interlandi couple here uh, and uh, may we all be benefited by uh, from today's lectures and the lectures that are going on this week. I request Professor Harold Roth uh, from the Contemplative Studies uh, to introduce today's speaker. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming this evening. I want to begin by uh, really, um, from the bottom of my heart, thanking John and Beth um, and the various members of your family who've established this wonderful, this wonderful testament to the life and personhood of their daughter, Mary. Mary's light and her interest in contemplative studies have kept shining for all these many years through their very generous and thoughtful gift. Um, I'd also like to thank the chaplain's office, um, uh, particularly Lee, uh, Kaleri, and Kendall, who uh, is the administrative assistant for the chaplain, Janet Cooper Nelson, of course, Janet herself. They manage the Interlanding Memorial Fund. I'd like to also thank the members of our organizing committee uh, for this wonderful week of lectures and workshops and class visits and lunches and dinners. And uh, we have really uh, appreciated the uh, efforts of uh, Drs. Uh, Mallinson and Singleton who have, uh, we really uh, pushed you hard the last few days and I hope you've enjoyed it uh, at least uh, half as much as we've enjoyed having you here. Um, so the members of the uh, organizing committee include uh, Cameron McCartan. Hey, just put your hand up if you're here. Um, David Bukta, uh, Jason Protas, uh, Finian Moore Gerdy, and Srinivas Reddy. And I want to especially thank somebody who usually disappears whenever it's time to thank her. But it's the uh, program manager for contemplative studies without whose uh, continuing efforts all of this would have been virtually impossible, Ann Hireman Hart. So can we uh, 
At least she can hear the applause. She sometimes accuses me of not remembering to give her props, but then disappears whenever I have the opportunity to do so. So anyway, if she's heard, I'll say, you heard the applause, and that was for you. Um, so just a few words about contemplative studies. Um, we are an innovative uh, new academic field uh, that we've been pioneering here at Brown for more than 15 years. Uh, though we were established as an official concentration starting in uh, September of uh, 2014. You all, uh, most of you are from Brown, so you know that concentration means it's a major. It's kind of Ivy talk for major. Um, so in contemplative studies, we truly value the kind of, what I would call a synergistic combination of the various fields of academic life and contemplative practice. And they usually stay far apart um, in higher education. And so it's these fields of humanities, that's scholarship on the historical, philosophical, and religious context in which the contemplative practices we study emerged and developed, very important aspect of contemplative studies. Uh, and we approach that very much in the same way as do scholars in other humanistic disciplines, uh, such as uh, philosophy, uh, history, religious studies, Asian studies, philology, and so on. But we also place an equal value on scientific research, uh, especially research that's been done in the brain sciences of neuroscience and uh, cognitive science and psychology, and in the clinical applications in public health and medicine that has burgeoned in the past several decades this research on contemplative practices. And the third dimension of contemplative studies, uh, and in some ways, I would argue, maybe the most important branch in contemplative studies as an academic field is the critical first-person study of contemplative practices in the classroom and in humanistic and scientific research. By insisting on the importance of subjective experience in learning about consciousness, about contemplation, we feel um, that we have, that there, we get from this very significant insights that cannot be learned in any other way. Uh, by the teaching and study of contemplative practices and understanding the various cognitive frameworks in which these practices are embedded, but never insisting that students and researchers believe in the veridicality of those frameworks as a sine qua non for their practice, we are able to bring an important and fresh perspective to the study of contemplation as a significant cross-cultural phenomenon. In establishing and developing the Mary Interlandi 05 lecture series, we have strived every year to be true to these important foundations of the field of contemplative studies. Um, in so doing, we've invited a very distinguished group of scholars and contemplative teachers over the years, um, including uh, some people whom you've read, some people who uh, you maybe have heard about, uh, Alan Wallace, uh, Father Thomas Keating, who uh, recently passed away, the founder of Centering Prayer, um, Ann Klein, uh, Harvey Aronson, Sharon Salzberg, Donald Rothberg, David Loy, uh, Alan Godless, John Cabot Zinn, and Jose Cabazon in the last two years. So this important combination of humanistic or scientific research with critical first-person engagement with contemplative practice is very well exemplified by our Mary Interlandi 05 lecturers and guests this year, Drs. James Mallinson and tonight's speaker, Dr. Mark Singleton. Uh, Mark Singleton works on the yoga tradition in, and modernity. Um, he completed a PhD in the uh, Cambridge University's Faculty of Divinity uh, he taught uh, for five years in the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, great books uh, of, the, uh, of Asian literature courses at St. John's College in Santa Fe. Um, he's been a long-term researcher, a research scholar at the American Institute of Indian Studies based in Jodhpur, Rajasthan. He's currently a senior researcher at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London and is working on a five-year European Research Council a funded project entitled the Hatha Yoga Project, mapping Indian and transnational traditions of physical yoga through philology and ethnography. 
in collaboration with Dr. Mallinson and another scholar, uh, Dr. Jason Birch. His books include Yoga in the Modern World, uh, The Yoga Body, which some of you have been reading for his classes, a really important work, uh, Gurus of Modern Yoga, The Roots of Yoga, which many others of you have been reading for other classes, a collection that he has translated uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Mallinson, um, and a, a numerous uh, articles, book chapters, encyclopedia entries on yoga. He is a very experienced scholar, but also a very experienced practitioner of yoga and its many modern traditions, combining exactly the kind of humanistic scholarship and first-person experience we hope to be encouraging and developing in our students here and students elsewhere who are slowly being introduced to our model. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Mark Singleton. Is that on? It is. Very good. It's working. Okay. Um, well, it's a great pleasure and a real honor to be here um, giving the, the uh, 15th annual Interlandi lecture this evening. Um, thank you, first of all, to John and Beth and the Interlandi family. Um, and um, also a, a big thanks to uh, Professor Hal Roth for inviting us here and for the, uh, the incredible time that we've had from you know, throughout this week. Um, it's been, uh, it's been uh, stimulating, engaging, exciting just to, to be here with the, the students and with the, the faculty. Um, thank you also to, to Professor Srinivas Reddy particularly and uh, Dr. Professor Finian Moore Garrity. Um, and yes, I hope I don't lower the tone too much uh, this evening. So the, the, the title of, of this talk is Continuity, Innovation and Power in Modern Yoga's Transformations, which is sort of a long way of um, um, not telling you what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my early um, research into yoga was, was about modern yoga, something that, that had been fairly recently theorized. Nobody had talked about modern yoga um, before that time. <coughs> in, in scholarship, that's to say, scholarship was very much sort of on, on yoga, was very much uh, defined by the study of a limited number of texts, in particular the Yoga Sutras of, of Patanjali, or the Patanjala Yoga Shastra. Um, <coughs> And the sort of modern stuff got left behind or overlooked or was considered too sort of base and frivolous to, to consider. And all that sort of started to change about uh, 15 years ago or so when, when uh, it suddenly became the focus of interest for a, for a handful of scholars. Uh, and has since, of course, sort of grown and grown and grown, such that the, the term modern yoga has sort of entered the, the sort of popular lexicon, popular sort of vocabulary. Um, and that, um, what, what I'd like to do today, uh, and I know that there's, there's kind of a, you know, a mixed audience, some people for whom this will be old news um, and will be, you know, very familiar with what I'm saying, um, but to, 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 to give you a kind of overview of what that is, first of all, what, modern, what we mean by modern yoga and why um, there might be any point in, in uh, actually studying it. Uh, and then to sort of consider what happens when yoga encounters other cultures, what happens when yoga sort of leaves its, its traditional context and travels around the world, or when it encounters um, modernity, when that which was traditional um, uh, encounters a world that has, that has changed so, so rapidly over, over the past uh, couple of hundred years. What, what happens? Uh, so I, I want to sort of invite you into, a, into that, that sort of story and, uh, and see where we get. So there is a, a pervasive um, sense that, uh, uh, sort of, uh, that yoga doesn't change. Yoga is perennial. Yoga has been the same forever. 
Uh, and I think it's that that sort of um, prevented a, a kind of uh, scrutiny of the kind of changes that, that were happening and that had been happening in yoga over the last 100, 150 years. So for instance, one of the, uh, one of the early pioneers, one of the early teachers of yoga to the West, Swami um, Vivekananda, Vivekananda uh, had this to say about, about yoga's history. He said, from the time it was discovered more than 4,000 years ago, yoga was perfectly delineated, formulated, and preached in India. The more ancient the writer, the more rational he is. <coughs> and I'll be, t I'll be coming back to um, Swami Vivekananda in, in a moment, just in, in my sort of potted history of, of modern yoga. But um, what I think I'd, I'd like to sort of set out from, from, the, uh, from the beginning is that th this, is, this is an idea that, that's very, very present and uh, that sort of resists a kind of historical analysis that yoga was there. It was there 4,000 years ago. It was there, well, you know, 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, depending on, on who's, who's speaking. And it's essentially the same and that, you know, no, nothing really changes. And uh, so you may have heard of uh, International Yoga Day. Then here's the, the section from, from the Common Yoga Protocol, which sort of su you know, suggests a similar story. The science of yoga has its origin thousands of years ago, long before the first religion or belief systems were born. The seers and sages carried this powerful yogic science to different parts of the world, including Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, and South America. Interestingly, modern scholars have noted and marveled at the close parallels found between ancient cultures across the globe. However, it was in India that the yogic system found its fullest expression. And there's a few things that, that I just want to sort of draw your attention to there because there'll be themes that recur as, as, uh, as we go through uh, some of this material. Um, <clears throat> so yoga is prior to, in, in this, th this is a narrative about about yoga and yoga history, and about a spiritual history, let's say, of, of uh, humanity from time immemorial. Uh, so it's prior to religion. That's, uh, that's what's you know, being said here, that it's something that's not religious, or that, that it's, you know, it doesn't have to do with mere belief systems or doctrine. Okay, so that, that's sort of an idea, that, that it's this sort of primordial spiritual movement that unites, uh, that unites humans. And that this, this was sort of spread around the globe from, from an India, I think it's implied here, uh, and, and sort of pops up everywhere uh, in, in the form of um, shamanism, in the form of sort of mystical practices uh, that, that we see, say, in, um, in ancient cultures in other parts of the world outside of India. And then, however, it says that it was in India that the yogic system found its fullest expression. And this, this is a kind of story that... Uh, that I think has a lot of um, gets a lot of traction. It's uh, you know it's a it's a story that I think um, a lot of p many people find engaging and, and find a, a sort of you know a sort of value in. And th I, I it seems to me that this is uh, there was a scholar of yoga called uh, Mircea Eliade who who worked at the uh, University of Chicago for years and authored what was the most influential book perhaps the most influential sort of scholarly study of yoga of the 20th century called Yoga, Immortality and Freedom, which some of you may have read. And he also, after that, uh, published a book called um, Shamanism, Shamanism, uh, which sort of proposed that there was this, this sort of you know, global um, pan-human expression of religiosity or, or of, uh, spirituality, let's say, spiritual techniques prior to religion, that a sort of substratum of, uh, of spiritual technology that could be, uh, that could be seen to, to be of, 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 the same, um, in, uh, of the same warp and weft, let's say. So um, <clears throat> to sort of, what I'm going to do is, is something, what I'm going to propose is something quite different. Not to say, uh, you know, uh, that this doesn't have any basis, I'm, I, 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 I can't judge. But what it does, what this does is to sort of prevent a kind of historical um, analysis, to prevent a sort of close historical examination of actually what happened, such that Eliade makes, makes some real, um, really big mistakes about what yoga history is and what, what yoga has become. So, for instance, his, his dating of the, the 
what are now referred to as the Yoga Upanishads is approximately a millennium and a half out. And it's, you know, the sort of, so what I, uh, the argument that, that um, or the, the approach that I'm taking is, is a historical one, and perhaps a skeptical one, and one that recognizes that within yoga traditions, there's always been change. There's always been change in uh, how the practices, which practices are carried out, which, um, how the practices are conceived in relation to a final goal, uh, and also how the human, uh, the nature of the human being is conceptualized and um, worked upon in yoga practice. And this is something that we see in the, in the Hatha Yoga project, for instance, that would be a moment of a great sort of revolution in yoga where everything changes. What, what had gone before remains and it remains part of the conversation, but suddenly you, you, know, you have something very new and there are moments like this throughout yoga's history. But when we get to the modern, things start to change incredibly fast. And that's where we are now. We're sort of at the end of a 150-year transformation of yoga, which, is, which has had some sort of profound effects on what yoga is. And also um, profound changes in how we understand what it is to be alive. So th those are some of the themes that I'm, uh, that I'm going, to be, uh, going to be talking about. And this all happened uh, because of uh, a process of globalization, because of... Um, technologies that were becoming available that allowed the transmission of knowledge around the globe and that allowed knowledge to um, move through people so you could you know hop on a on a boat or an airplane or now you know sort of get on Skype you could uh, th there was new print technology cheap easy to reproduce to sell to sort of uh, spread ideas there was photography which was new so you could actually see things that before would have been very hard to convey in words. Last night we, we had a, a practical uh, session. Well, I, I was talking about one of, the, one of the 18th century yoga texts that we're working on, which describes, which is one of the first to describe sequences of postures. And I, the, the game was, I, I was reading out, um, reading out these descriptions of, of how to do the postures and then seeing what, what people made of them. And there's this great, great sort of variety um, uh, in, in, in what was done. Whereas, you know, if, we had, if we'd had a, a, a photograph, you could have seen it right away. So in that way, you can see how um, technologies like photographs or video can actually change things, that can actually sort of um, allow a particular part of a tradition, in this case, po the postures of yoga, to sort of um, suddenly be transmitted into the world. And that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with, a, a very sort of tangled situation uh, where there's innovation, but there's innovation that always, almost always appeals to tradition and tries to situate itself in tradition, uh, so, such that it becomes very difficult to sort of separate out what's what. But what we can do is to, what yoga, what this kind of study of yoga can permit us to do is not only to sort of inquire into what yoga is itself, but also to, to have, give us a kind of snapshot of a socio-cultural reality. So um, Bruno Latour famously said that, um, uh, I'll, I'll read it out in fact, he claimed that the whole of French society comes into view if one tugs on Pasteur's bacteria. Okay, so, you know, if you start to look at how, how, you know, that sort of history of medicine, how that happens, then you start to see how society, um, you know, you start to, you get a snapshot of that. And we might ask the same thing. What happens if one starts to tug on modern yoga? What do we see? Um, and one answer might be a prismatic view of the religious, social and cultural aspirations of contemporary individuals, their metaphysical, cultural and religious politics, their relationship to their nation and other nations, and so on. So that, in short, is, the, uh, is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'll pass over this quickly, in fact, I think. This is, uh, this is, this is uh, from, from Hinduism today. And it, um, 
It's about the, the so-called great yoga debate. Many, some of you will remember it back in, back in 2010, um, which wasn't, wasn't after all so great, but was a, was a, a sort of ma made a lot of noise. Uh, and it was a, a conversation between um, Asim Shukla, the head of the um, Hindu American Foundation, uh, and Deepak Chopra. And um, Asim Shukla arguing that, that yoga was, was Hindu, uh, and denouncing the theft of yoga by particularly um, Americans, uh, or non-Hindu Americans at, at least. And then um, Deepak Chopra, who says, no, it's not, and sort of espouses that, that, um, that idea of a sort of global spirituality. Um, but it seems to me that both of them got something... It wasn't really much of a debate because... The, it wasn't grounded in anything. It didn't sort of, you know, offer any kind of historical analysis. It just ended up being being a sort of being a sort of shouting match. So what I'm what I'm proposing in uh, in, in place of that is a history of modern yoga, and that started uh, the sort of the recent study of modern yoga started probably in 2004 with two books, one by Elizabeth de Michaelis called A History of Modern Yoga and another one by Joseph Alter, which we'll, I'll talk about later. And I, I'm putting this up here. I don't, I don't want to go through, um, go through all these types, but she proposed excuse me, a kind, of, a kind of typology of modern yoga. She said, there's this thing called modern yoga. It's different than what has come before. It's different than um, traditional yoga, which is also a problematic term. And she surmised that it came from the work of Swami Vivekananda, and that we have a modern psychosomatic yoga, which is um, focused on practice, a kind of experiential epistemology. That's to say that you, the primary thing, you prioritize your own experience. There's, a f there's few doctrinal normative restrictions, and it's kind of private, and she gives examples of that. O opposite, on the other side, is the dom denominational yoga, which is sort of the more sort of cultic, um, led by charismatic leaders. From the side on the left, we have things like modern postural yoga, modern meditational yoga, uh, modern postural yoga being what she meant by, you know, sort of the, the asanas, what many people today think of as yoga, and modern meditational yoga being, um, being things like, so, well, she says some, some modern Buddhist groups like, for instance, uh, sort of mindfulness groups or vipassana meditation and so on. And then she adds another one, which is neo-Hindu Hindu yoga, which she says has close ideological links to Hindu revivalism and nationalism, for example, the RSS. So um, I, I show you this just to sort of um, to see where so to, I, I began my thinking, because I did a, a, a PhD with, um, with Elizabeth de Michaelis. Uh, and <clears throat> I think, you know, it's sort of useful for, for a beginning. It's useful to sort of... Uh, Throw, throw something down and sort of say, well, yes, there's that bit, there's that bit and that bit. But in fact, you know, it's probably a little bit more dynamic than that. And I think also in thinking about how modern yoga works or how, how yoga changes and develops, we also have to factor in studies like this one. Because when you write something, when you describe uh, a situation and people read it, uh, and take it on board, things start to change. And that's something that we've seen uh, that's quite surprising at first. I mean, it shouldn't, shouldn't be surprising, really. But now, you know, modern yoga has sort of entered uh, the sort of popular discourse. Modern, po uh, modern postural yoga also has been, become a word that people actually know and use. And so in this situation, I, I think, you know, we have to sort of, uh, we have to think about how scholarship which sometimes, you know, the sort of ivory tower model were, were sort of <coughs> removed from, uh, from the object of study. But in fact, uh, are, we, are we contributing also to this history that, that, we, that we claim to be describing? And um, we, uh, we were recent, Jim and I were recently accused <laughs> at, <laughs> at a panel, uh, accused, we were told at the a panel at the uh, American Academy of Religions on, on Roots of Yoga that, that we were creating a new canon. And, you know, in some respects, that's true. You know, that sort of the, the work that you do, the reflections that you, you make on this kind of thing um, have all sorts of unfortunate effects <laughs> on, uh, on people. This is our, uh, one of our friends. Uh, yes. 
he was taking his uh, taking his study seriously. So this is this is the kind of thing that happens in a tradition, uh, in you know, even in a modern tradition or a, a recently um, developing tradition. That it, it never that description starts to change the way uh, the way things are viewed and then the way things are are, are practiced. So I'd, I'd just like to give you a, a sort of a, a quick rundown, I suppose, of, of this uh, of this history, such as it, it was. It's it's been presented. It's one story. It's one one way through the uh, the story of modern yoga, and um, this is really a, a history of early modern India, starting with um, um, Ram Mohan Roy and, and the uh, cultural. Uh, society that he founded, the Brahmo Samaj. He's, he's often referred to as the father of modern India. Um, and he established this in, in 1843. He also established the Unitarian Mission in Bengal. Um, and he was influential in spreading Hindu ideas to America through the Transcendentalists. And if any of you know Emerson and Thoreau and, and their work and their, you know, their love of the Bhagavad Gita, and uh, and it was in fact Thoreau who who said, you know, um, sometimes I am a yogi. I mean, uh, arguably he he didn't really know what he was talking about, but he, <laughs> you know, it's a moment. It's a moment in uh, in uh, in this sort of interaction. Uh, this sort of globalizing interaction of, of ideas and a renaissance of Hinduism and, and subsequently of, of yoga that, that's ongoing today. So it's, you know, it's, not just, it's not just one way. It's not sort of being transmitted, say, from India to, to the world. It's also the world sort of, you know, those, those messages sort of bouncing back. Um, <clears throat> then uh, just to, to move on, Quickly, we have Keshub Chandra Sen, who is a later, a later leader of the, um, of the Brahamo Samaj, who was particularly interested in, in yoga. And I just want to read out one, one of his passages. So th this sort of encapsulates for me what's going on. We Hindus are especially endowed with and distinguished for the yoga faculty, which is nothing but this power of spiritual communion and absorption. Waving the magic wand of yoga, we command Europe to enter into the heart of Asia, and Asia to enter into the mind of Europe. And they obey us. And we instantly realize within ourselves a European Asia and an Asiatic Europe, a commingling of Oriental and Occidental ideas and principles. And that, for me, is, is sort, of, it's sort of almost prophetic. You know, it's sort of, he's, he's describing what, what he's doing, what he, what he wants, to, to see come about, and what effectively ha, you know, is, has come about in, in, uh, um, ov over the succeeding decades and over the, the succeeding uh, century. And then uh, finally, so uh, uh, another member of, of the Brahmo Samaj, um, Swami Vivekananda, who, as I've mentioned, is credited by Elizabeth Michaelis, this, this sort of first um, groundbreaking scholar of modern yoga, um, with providing the blueprint for subsequent yoga practice in uh, America and Europe, particularly. And uh, as we know, as many of you will know, um, Swami Vivekananda arrived, came to Chicago in 1893, and was a speaker at the um, World Parliament of Religions which is, is I, think, I think, the first of its kind, where there were, there were representatives from, from all different religions from around the world. So sort of a product of the, of the um, um, academic discipline of comparative religions. You know, it's, you got to the point where you can say, oh, there's that. That's a religion. That, you know, whereas previously there was just Christianity, say. So, um, and Swami Vivekananda's great coup was to, uh, was to sort of say, well, uh, <laughs> the, 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 let me back up a little bit. The, 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 the secret agenda of, of this parliament was to gather all these people together and to demonstrate that uh, actually it was Christianity was the flower of all these religions. Swami Vivekananda turned that on its head and, and uh, um, set out to demonstrate that actually no, it was, uh, it was Hinduism and gave a series of very, very moving, moving speeches that are still available. Oh, and the audio recording that you can find on YouTube of Swami Vivekananda is... is uh, excuse me. Yes. The audio recording is not Swami Vivekananda's Is, voice. is a fake, was it's my next word. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, he came to. Um, he, w he was born in, in modern, you know, modern Calcutta, which was a marketplace of ideas, a very sort of culturally rich and uh, um, uh, happening, happening place. And then he, he spoke at the, at the parliament. He, he was the first person, subsequently he went on to teach yoga and about yoga and also practical yoga, probably for the first time in, in uh, the United States. And um, he, he said he was going to manufacture a few yogis. He didn't have a, he wasn't a member of a, of a, of a, yogic, uh, of a yogic sect. His, his guru, um, uh, Ramakrishna, is a very interesting character who I, I won't talk about now. Um, but he then wrote this book, Raja Yoga, which, which became a kind of blueprint for subsequent, um, subsequent expressions of yoga and, and uh, sort of inspired a host of imitators. And many, you'd, if you haven't read Raja Yoga, it's really worth a read. Um, for what it, what the, the version of yoga that it presents and its discourses, it's him talking to his American audience, talking to them in their language, using the concepts that they understand and know, such as those of modern science, such as those of, as, as I'll say later, psychology, um, such as uh, astronomy. He was a really very modern man, and also, crucially speaking, the language of humanism, uh, which is not necessarily, which is not indeed what uh, the, the kind of language of classical yoga. So a great, a great revolution. And um, I am going to, I'm, it doesn't stop there, obviously. This is the beginning, and what I don't want to do is give you a sort of a blow-by-blow -blow account of, of the subsequent history of yoga, but this, this is the beginning. This is how it gets rolling, uh, and there are various phases uh, to, to sort of put it in really broad, uh, broad strokes. You know, you have this kind of first movement, uh, and then, th sort of in the first half of the 20th century, we start to see a, a kind of burgeoning of, uh, of, of uh, yoga practice uh, outside of India. It dies down a bit with the Second World War and then gets going in the 50s and 60s again. You have this new wave that some of you may remember of the, the sort of um, hippie spiritual, um, well, let's say the, the gurus, the, the, the guru phase from the mid-60s onwards, with the arrival of, of gurus like uh, Satchidananda, um, um, Osho, who else, Muktananda, and this sort of countercultural uh, um, efflorescence that have, uh, you know, inspired often by countercultural figures like the Beatles. And then, you know, other phases as well. This sort of, this sort of goes in, uh, in these phases. In the 90s, we, we get this incredible rise of postural yoga uh, through the likes of uh, BKS Iyengar, through um, Patabi Joyce and Ashtanga Yoga, which brings us sort of up to the present. So that's a very, a very, very short uh, sort of um, whistle-stop tour of, uh, of yoga's history. And we can talk about that more in, in the questions, perhaps. But what I'd like to do now is just to look at um, some of the ways in which yoga has attached itself to certain ideas, has become associated very closely with other disciplines which are not traditionally part of yoga, but that can be seen to be sort of in there. So in modern times, yoga has been identified with uh, psychology, self-development, exercise, science, stress relief, spirituality, body work, gymnastics, bodybuilding, magic, and so on. And this is really, uh, in some respects, because to understand something, you need a frame. You need, you need your, your lens. You need your, your um, sort of collection of, uh, of knowledge, of cultural knowledge, of, uh, of, of learning, in order to understand something. So <clears throat> when yoga comes out of its original context, comes, is, is translated culturally and linguistically, it's very hard for people to understand what's going on. And so they need a particular frame. And therefore, yoga started to be interpreted along these lines. And as we'll, we'll, we'll see a little bit later, um, Abraham Maslow will be talking about him, the psychologist. When, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that sort of, that principle sort of applies here. So, ah, 
say, you know, I'm, I'm a psychologist. Well, yoga, mm, yes, that looks a bit psychological. Yoga must be psychology. Or, um, oh, yes, th there's a kind of progression, a sort of bettering of oneself. It must be sort of part of, like, you know, this sort of self-development, self-improvement, or it's exercise and, and so on. So you have these multiple sort of creative misunderstandings, you might say, that, uh, that characterize the, um, the uh, history, history of yoga. One of those um, encounters that, that I've described at length in, uh, in my book, Yoga Body, of, uh, from 2010, was the physical culture revival, which was a global phenomenon that often uh, sort of spread, well, it's a bit more complicated than this, but sort of spread from, from Europe. So in particular, there was very strong sort of gymnastic and, and physical culture uh, traditions in Scandinavia which is an interesting case, um, Britain, France, and, and so on. And, and that sort of spread around the world, you know, through, this, uh, through print culture, through, um, through people sort of touring the world, like the bodybuilder Sandow, and, <clears throat> and it took off. And one of the, uh, this, one of the stories that I try to present in, in Yoga Body is how, uh, how this affected yoga how this new understanding of what the body was for, of what um, fitness was, or health was, or well-being was, or even strength, what strength looked like, transformed the way that people understood yoga. Uh, so th this is just, I, I won't even mention, I won't go into any detail, but some of the pioneers of this kind of merger of, of hatha yoga and physical culture here really making efforts and very sort of creative efforts to understand Hatha Yoga not in the sense that, uh, for instance, um, Jim was, was, uh, has been talking about in, in his lectures and, um, and, and elsewhere, not, not in that sort of that older classical Hatha Yoga sense, but defined through sort of, you know, the, the, a, a new sort of modern paradigm of well-being, of health, of, of what the, um, the modern subject is and what the modern subject is for, and therefore what yoga is for. And th this was, for, that's not to say that yoga is physical culture. It's not to say that yoga is exercise, of course. It's to say that these were new understandings that were um, subsequently shaping not just uh, yoga outside of India, but, but also yoga in, in India, uh, you know, in, in certain places, in certain places. Another one would be uh, would be science. I'm just going to take a few examples just to sort of talk you through uh, talk you through some principles. So on the uh, on the left here we have um, Swami Kuvalayananda at um, who who was set up one of the first modern yoga research institutions, meeting um, Pandit Nehru, and if we, I think we have. Um, Indira Gandhi there peeking over his shoulder, uh, who said that yoga will not progress unless it's, unless it's examined in the light of advances made by science. And thus beginning, well, not quite beginning, but you know, really gi giving a, uh, a strong push to the interpretation of yoga as science, as something that, uh, that not only should be studied scientifically, as they were doing, you know, sort of they were sticking tubes and EEGs on, on practicing yogis, um, but also scientific uh, in, in a kind of doubled sense, so that the, the yogi becomes the subject and the object of scientific inquiry. Yoga becomes, um, yoga is likened to that process, so the, the meditating yogi is the scientist and also the, uh, the, the subject of that science. And this is a very, very strong kind of theme. And um, such that scientific observation of the body, particularly here, becomes an index of spiritual attainment. So the better you can do these practices, the more vacuum you can get in, in your abdomen doing, doing various bandhas, indicates something more. It's like a, it's like a sign, it's like a, a sort of a crack through which we can see they can see sort of you know these the spiritual realms. It's quite a quite a fascinating sort of moment, and uh, th this this is one of my favourite images um, of of Swami uh, Shivananda, 
who was a, a trained doctor and one of the most influential of the sort of early global gurus, you might say. I mean, he, he and, uh, in, invented, I think, the yoga correspondence course with his stethoscope here, peering into the body of a, of a traditional yogin. So there's a kind of switch. I, I take this as a, a sort of par paradigmatic moment where the yogi who um, originally, traditionally had a kind of the, this yogi pratyaksha, this, this ability to see, to see what's really happening, this, this powerful vision, uh, and, and particularly, you know, of, of the body, a master of the body, let's say. Um, and now that's switched around. The person in charge in this photo is Swami, Swami Shivananda. Everybody's looking at him. And he's the one that can see inside with these, these sort of modern instruments. So that, that was a sort of, you know, a watershed moment in, uh, in yoga's history. Everything changes or starts to change. And of, of course, we're still there, right? I mean, that scientific research is still, is still going on. <clears throat> um, one sort of sub-example within that is, is the, uh, the history of, of the chakras. Which, is, uh, as Jim was telling us, in the uh, in the earliest in the earliest context, are um, loci locuses in the body for um, for meditation. They're imagined, you might say. Um, we're lucky lucky to have Dr. Professor Shaman Hatley here, who's a who's an expert in in that, the earlier history. Um, but what what happens? What happens as we come into modernity is a kind of merging, is a kind of, do you imagine, do you remember tracing paper? Does that still exist? Where you, <laughs> you know, you sort of put a piece of tracing paper down and you, you trace something and then you hold it, you can see it and you can put it on a different piece of paper and, uh, and trace it on there. What, what this process is like is multiple pieces of tracing paper with, with different sort of interpretations being laid on top of each other. And I think we see this clearly in this 19, uh, circa 1902 book um, of edition of the Shat Chakra Nirupana with pictures where we have the, the sort of traditional iconography of, of the chakras over here with the Bija mantra in the middle. Uh, but also an association with physical realities, whereas before, you know, it had been sort of imagined um, or brought into, brought, you know, into being through um, imaginative processes. Here it's identified with the epigastric uh, plexus. So Manipur Chakra is the epigastric plexus. Um, and, the, you know, the similar thing happening here. And we see this process taking over and pushing out earlier understandings of what the chakras and, and what this sort of yogic body is. And we had a, com a similar conversation in, in the, one of the classes earlier about th this sort of um, unusual place that we're not used to in inhabiting, which is somewhere between the imagined and the real. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're sort of used to ima <laughs> of, of sort of drawing, um, you know, being quite black and white. Well, that's real, but that's not. Um, in, in, these, in these yogic practices, you're constructing something, you're bringing something into being that, is then, that then has a real reality. But here, those, th that starts to sort of get pushed out, and we come increasingly into a kind of um, biological reality and into a sort of model of biomedicine, of anatomy. This is a later book, 1929, um, which... Uh, associates the, the, the chakras with, um, with plexuses, plexi, and the, kunda, the famous kundalini with, with the vagus nerve, which I think is here, isn't it? Um, and that's, it's, real, you know, it's a real moment. And it's sort of like there's no going back. You know, when we get to this, like science sort of wins. And just one more example, a sort of a, new, a more sort of new age, you might say, uh, interpretation of the chakras, which, which are then, you know, uh, um, associated with with um, with emotions. And I think this is very closely so closely uh, linked to sort of particular psychological models which have grown up alongside yoga. So. <clears throat> Oh, and th this, is, this is the last example. This is something that, that I've been uh, 
quite, you know, so, sort of following for a, for a few months now. Do you, do you know these, these new systems of diagnostic medicine, machine medicine, with what, Watson, the Watson machine from IBM, um, and so on? And, and these are the, these sorts of, uh, these sorts of software are becoming very popular and, and apparently, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, well, we have, uh, we have some doctors in the room. Who can, who can possibly speak to this. But here they are again. This is the Aura and Chakra Surgeon Commandment Software. So this, this idea, you know, it really, do, it really does have sort of a history that you can follow, and it's still with us today, that these chakras, you can actually sort of work on them. You can, uh, you know, you can do surgery on them and, uh, and heal yourself. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, isn't that great? I, I love that. So if we're going to have a little bit of a little bit of a musical interlude now. Um, uh, I, I'd like to talk about yoga and psychology and the meaning of life. Um, yoga and psychology, as, as, I'll, uh, as I'll, I hope to show a little bit, have uh, the same moment of birth almost, and a, a, a parallel and inter well an intertwined history. So here's here's a, this is the uh, I hope this works. This is the the Chad Mitchell trio. The, uh, the Ballad of Sigmund Freud. Nothing's happening. <coughs> oh, that's disappointing. Never mind. I'll, uh... Are you just halfway between the narrative and the real? <laughs> that's right. Okay, never mind. It doesn't matter. For, um, but the, uh, the Ballad of Sigmund Freud, if you haven't heard it, it's, it's really quite wonderful. Um, so, uh, psychology has had a profound, profound influence on the way that people understand yoga today, inside, uh, well, globally. Um, over the, over the, well, since Vivekananda, Vivekananda was at, at least, at least since then, he was fascinated with psychology. So, if you look at this 1896 book. Um, Raja Yoga and, and sort of have a look through or you know have a look through for references to psychology he's constantly equating yoga with psychology and it sort of begins uh, th this process of, of sort of reinforcement where certain psychologists look back and, at yoga and say oh yes you're right um, <clears throat> Vivekananda wanted the preface to Raja Yoga to be written by William James the, um, it, it never happened, and I'm, I'm not sure that they met. I don't know if there's any record. I th there would be a record if they had. But James also paraphrases Vivekananda in his books. And so you start to get this sort of feedback loop where suddenly, yes, yoga is, is, not, you know, is not only compatible with psychology, but might be the same thing. And th this is, it seems so normal now because I think we swim in the water at the waters of a, a kind of psychological uh, psychological discourse, um, but it really, you know, it's 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 quite a it's quite a moment, um, and after. So there, there's William James on the end. We also have um, other authors like um, um, James H. Loiber. I don't know how to say his name. Loiber. Um, who wrote the, the psychology of religious mysticism in 1925 with, with sort of ideas about, ill-formed Ill ideas about yoga, but which nonetheless, you know, sort of take yoga and make it, um, make it in psychology. We have C.G. Jung, of course, who, um, <coughs> who wrote about the psychology of Kundalini yoga and uh, sort of, you know, took, took yoga and, and uh, brought it into his archetype system. And that, surprisingly, perhaps, has remained a very popular way to sort of to, to understand what yoga does. Jungian theory uh, and the sort of popularization of, of um, Jungian psychology has, has, been, has been huge and often quite, quite closely linked to, um, uh, to yoga. And then finally, we have Wilhelm Reich, uh, who was one of Freud's uh, early students and had a falling out, falling out with uh, with Freud. He wanted to work on psycho, um, psychoanalysis. He thought that the body should be involved rather than sort of you know lying there and just just talking. He thought that um, psychological realities became lodged in the body. So this this idea of body armoring that you you may have talked about that you know you store 
uh, anger in your in your you know hip, and you know all, you, certain emotions get locked inside the body, and so by massage in his case, or you know, some, um, you, you had to release these things, and that he didn't have any time for yoga. Um, but those sorts of ideas through his uh, through his disciples um, um, got v very much sort of got. Uh, transmitted so that you'll hear those things. I mean, if, I know there's some there's yoga teachers here that by doing you know the, the pigeon pose, you you sort of you know you, you can release all this anger or sadness. Uh, there's there's all sorts of ideas that get a little bit uh, a bit confused, but it's it's very much there I think in um, in uh, in modern yoga and in systems like Phoenix Rising. I, I think it might have come and gone now, where they put you in a Somebody, uh, one of my um, friends told me that they, they strap you into position and then dialogue. You know, they sort of, you're, you're, they're, you're sort of trapped there in your, uh, in your, in your yoga position and, and then you sort of do, do talk therapy. So I, I want to just uh, think a little bit about the, the construction of the subject in psychology. Because psychology is a discipline that claims to describe, and just as I said at the beginning with, with, uh, with scholarship, it also changes things. It also brings certain realities and new realities into being. So just a, a, a sort of a, a sketch of, uh, of what happens when you start to adopt a psychological worldview, which after all is fairly new, but is, is so much our, our reality today. So, how psychology changed their everyday life? The, there was sort of the, the invention of a, well, a, a new kind of reflexive selfhood, right? We have, a, we have an unconscious, we have a, an ego, an id, and a superego, and there are vast territories within us that, are that we are strangers to. We are not who we think we are. There's a kind of pathology of everyday life, and that this was something that we were talking about at... Uh, at, at lunch. Oh, th this is part of the, uh, the song that you didn't hear. Um, you know, it sort of goes that, that Freud started what he was doing because not enough people were getting sick, so he needed to create more sick people. And, uh, and I've, I put there, C, you know, CF denial, because if you say, I'm not sick, then you definitely are. You know, <laughs> that's sort of... And so uh, daily life starts to, get, starts to get more difficult. There's all, you know, all sorts of new maladies, all sorts of new sort of mental problems that that, uh, that can come up. Does anybody know the, the film, the early film, The Secrets of the Soul by, by Pabst, which is a, a sort of an early, um, sort of like a manifesto of, of, uh, of psychoanalysis, which has, has this poor guy who comes in and says, I'm so unhappy, I, I just keep having, having these, these um, you know, fantasies of throttling my wife. And, uh, and uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the doctor says, aha, well, there's this new medicine called psychoanalysis. We can help you. Everybody breathes a sigh of relief. Um, there's also the naming and formalizing of emotion, which is important in, in what I'm going to say um, subsequently, if I, if I don't run out of time. Um, so that, you, you know, emotions become things, and they become things that stick around. They're not context-specific anymore. Um, well, uh, you know, they're not, they're not sort of uh, things that, that come and go, they become sort of fixed entities, much like in that idea that, that you know, you've, you've, got, you've got anger stuck in, your, stuck in your hip that get locked inside and that you can then sort of bring out and release, yeah? These familiar ideas. Um, relationship becomes a focus of inner life with, with sort of keywords like communication, intimacy, intimacy, working on, I'm working on my relationship at the moment. Um, work productivity, of course, historically very closely linked to um, to uh, psychology, and that, in fact, you know, much of many of the early developments were in the context of getting people to work better, work harder, and new modes of relating, which is a bit, you know, the same thing: emotional control, learned sociability, good communication, neutral speech, and uh, and psychology is used to sell things. So it seems to me that um, that we see this in in sort of in spirituality, broadly speaking, the kind of spiritual. Um, uh, common parlance of which yoga uh, partakes is very much sort of drawn from, from a kind of spiritualized um, uh, psychology. So, for instance, 
you're, you're encouraged to, to discover your type. And there, there are, so what's your, what's your dosha baby by, by Lisa Marie um, Coffey? For example, you know, that, that's, a, that's uh, and it, it's very, you know, you, you also have books like Yoga for Your Type, which, where you're encouraged to sort of put yourself in, in, particular, in particular boxes. Or what's your dharma? Now, I think it seems to me that the most interesting, uh, one of the most interesting things you can do is to try and identify words that appear not to be subject to historical change, like breathing or like um, spirituality, or like dharma, and then see how, in fact, they, they, they do change. And that, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus a little bit on, on dharma here, which is, a, is, a, is an industry that, again, is very closely allied to the, the, um, the modern history of, uh, of yoga. So just once again, a, a sort of, you know, the five dharma types, as we were saying, um, a sort of move to, to type, you know, to type the individual subject. And here you get to be one of five. Okay, so you can either be an educator, a merchant, a laborer, a warrior, or an outsider. <laughs> Which are you? Well, buy the book and you can find out. Um, so, you know, while sort of promising a kind of freedom, a freedom from constraints of, of you know, it, it sort of, you, we're, we're often sort of, it's like it's a sort of cattle being sort of herded into, into one, of these, one of these boxes. And um, this, it seems to me, now here's, I'll, I'll, pose, I'll put this more as a question. Um, I think, and I, I wonder if you agree, that, that Maslow and the sort of uh, the human potential movement uh, born at, you know, coming out of um, sort of gurus like Maslow, like Rogers, that, that have a kind of hierarchy of needs that end up in, in self-actualization, has been another one of those tracing paper moments where a word like self-actualization appears to mean uh, a, kind of, a, a kind of spiritual apex. Um, but that then, you know, gets, get this, gets this other layer sort of... Um, plastered on top of it, such that, such that yoga is understood to be a process of self-improvement, such that spiritual practices um, are to become the most that one can be, a sort of, you know, continuing an ongoing self-improvement model that is very closely linked, in fact, part and parcel of the modern sort of psychological model of the, uh, of the individual. And then just as a, as a final example here, uh, of, uh, a bo book by Stephen Cope, who is a, who's a yoga author, who wrote a book called um, Yoga and the Quest for the True Self. It seems to me that this is one of the key ideas in, in modern yoga's construction of the individual, which is vital to knowing why you're doing yoga and what yoga is. He says in this book, The Great Work of Your Life, yogis insist that every single human being has a unique vocation. They call this dharma. Dharma means variously path, teaching, or law. For our purposes in this book, it will mean primarily vocation or sacred duty. It means most of all, and in all cases, truth. Yogis believe that our greatest responsibility in this life is to this inner possibility, this dharma. And they believe that every human being's duty is to utterly, fully, and completely embody his own idiosyncratic dharma. Does that sound familiar? I mean, it's sort of, you know... Um, what I, what I want to sort of focus on uh, is, is this sort of idea that everybody has their own dharma and you have to find it. And you have to find it by looking inside, by, by a, a kind of psychological investigation. Um, <clears throat> and it's idiosyncratic. If you look at the, the cover of um, Stephen Cope's book, you have, who do you suppose that is on the cover? Anyone? Mm, think more Indian than Hercules. Yes, exactly. So it's Arjuna from the, uh, uh, from the Mahabharata. Um, uh, and it, this, is, this, is his, this is his example. And it's, it's such an interesting moment because he's taking a teaching from the Bhagavad Gita about Svadharma, the, you know, the self-dharma, self literally, and making it into, uh, in, in, you know, giving it this spin. Here's what the, here's what the Gita says. It's better to follow one's own dharma imperfectly than that of another well. Better to die in one's own dharma, the dharma of another brings danger. Um, 
But of course, what, what's being said here is that one should follow the dharma that one was born into, of, of, the, of, the, of the particular um, group that, that one is born into, not precisely what, what Stephen Cope is saying, that, that you should go off and do what, whatever, whatever you like, you know, through, through a sort of process of introspection. And so we see sort of, you know, the, the yoga of the, of the Bhagavad Gita being sort of um, radically reinterpreted to fit with modern aspirations and, and the sort of, you know, the construction of the, of the modern subject, if you like. Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wrapping up in, uh, in, uh, in about five or ten minutes. So um, I've said a little bit about the uh, you know the sort of older history. I've, I've given a, a very you you can read you know if this is stuff interests you. There's there's plenty of material now on the history of modern yoga, and I've I've sort of tried to sort of just touch on a few of the of the themes that, that interest me. You know some of the, some of the places where you see these sort of transformations of of, of yoga happening. I want to come right now sort of up to the present and the future. And I, I usually sort of, I'm quite resistant to sort of looking into and speculating on the future of yoga, which is a question I often get, because I, I don't have that yogi pratyaksha, I can't see what's coming. <coughs> but if yoga is, the way that yoga develops is in some respects a response to the concerns of the day, in some respects a manifestation of the way we are looking at it and at spiritual traditions and at what the what the human being is how we understand that then it's quite useful to sort of uh, well it's quite interesting at the very least to sort of um, think about what comes next where are we now and what does that mean for the for the near future so um, I just want to want to talk about yoga and technology for for a moment. Um, if you haven't if you haven't noticed, uh, technology is is uh, is starting to become very important in in a, a particular kind of religion, a particular kind of uh, well, I mean, most closely associated with Silicon Valley, um, associated with a kind of with biohacking. Where you sort of, you know, you, you, you use, uh, say, smart drugs uh, to to override or manipulate um, physiological processes or, or, or mental processes, right? You, and you use technology to enhance who you are as a mere meat machine. In that horrible, horrible phrase, um, in order to become more than human, in order to sort of, you know, become cyborg. And maybe some of us are already. You know, we're, we're maybe we're all sort of you know moving in that direction. So just just two examples here. Just as you know, um, the, we have the uh, the Muse headset, which monitors uh, brain activity during your meditation session and can tell you and can tell you how you're doing. And so th this is start this is being used by um, by yogis. In fact, it was it was um, a, a, a yoga practitioner in Silicon Valley who who um, first introduced me to this. And um, a CNN, the article in CNN says, imagine a gadget that knows your mind better than you do. So what, what does this mean, I think? You know, for what, what kind of a human are we looking at here? What kind of a yogi are we looking at here? Is, are we moving to a point, as many of you will know, in uh, the definition, the classical definition of yoga in, in Patanjali, yoga is chitta vritti nirodha. Yoga is the... Um, cessation of the fluctuations, the vrittis of the mind. Are we coming to a place where we, we are starting to identify vrittis with, with sort of algorithms? Are we merely algorithmic machines um, through which, which other machines can manipulate into a state of cessation or bliss? Um, uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to see. Um, it, it very much looks like that in the hands of people like Raymond Kurzweil. I don't know if you, if you know him, who was um, a, you know, a, a futurist who, who, um, who's, whose great dream or fantasy, you might say, is the technological singularity, the sort of uploading of consciousness to, uh, to the great server in the sky. Um, so that's you know, it's more of a question, like is, is, this where we're, is this where we're going, or some of us are going? Uh, and another, this is my absolute favorite example of, of the moment of, um, 
of technology, which is the, the Nadi X yoga pants. Uh, so that when you when you don't need to go to yoga classes anymore because you you do your yoga pose and if your hips are a bit out it sort of pokes you so that so that you can uh, you know you can, you can get it right subtly vibrating yoga pants um, that help you to stay present for your entire practice. Um, <clears throat> so is is yeah is is that where we are? That's what uh, that's what I wonder. Um, are we becoming spiritual machines, as Ray Kurzweil would have us believe? Um, there's, a, the, there's a book called, uh, translated into English as Atomized by, um, oh, Michel Houellebecq, um, that, that sort of gives a scenario where a, a, a Nobel Prize winning geneticist um, has come up with a way to modify humans so that genetically he can modify out sickness, old age and death. He can modify out um, the, you know, sort of uh, anger, lust, all those things that uh, through yogic practice, through um, Buddhist meditation, we're trying to get rid of. You can do that scientifically. And um, this scientist then, then disappears, maybe commits suicide, we don't know. And his, uh, his disciple starts to spread his message around the world to the UN, um, to various religious groups. And uh, in, in this sort of thought experiment, the Buddhists go, oh, well, that's quite interesting. I mean, would the Buddha have objected to that? Would the Buddha have, have said, well, no, you can't do it because you haven't, you know, you haven't sat for long enough. If, if the effect is the same, um, question to you, if the effect is the same, does it matter? Is, is, this, is a technological enlightenment possible or desirable? And another question, is it the same thing? And then, uh, oh, yes. So th this is Joseph Alter reading Donna, Donna Haraway. It says, in many respects, a cyborg is the embodied form of yogic practice, a kind of jivan mukta as every man. So there we go. We can all become living, living liberate, liberated while living beings um, through, through technology. And then, then finally, on a, on a, to end on a, a slightly uh, serious note, we're at a point in, in history, if, uh, if you hadn't noticed, we're at a point in time where, which has come around very quickly from there not being a, a sort of problem in, in the collective consciousness at all to the point at which we suddenly don't have very much time to ward off, uh, to, do, uh, to take action against um, climate catastrophe and all, all, all that that implies such that we can expect in the very near future um, high levels of things like uh, heat death, mass starvation due to, due to crop failure, um, drowning, wildfire, dying oceans, uh, unbreathable air, plagues of warming, economic collapse, societal breakdown, wars, climate conflict, and so on. This isn't a future thing, of course, as we know it's happening now. Um, so what, what, is the, what would be the place of yoga in, in our current reality? What, how do we uh, confront these things? What, um, you know, what kind of yoga might indeed be produced as a result of, of this situation where we are now? If we go back to the very, very beginning of yoga, or, or rather the, the, sort of the beginning of the, of the sort of formal use of that word, in uh, the context of ascetics, of renouncers who left, us, who you know, sort of withdrew from sort of um, conventional life in India, and uh, the renouncers, you know, groups who still exist today, like Buddhists, like Jainas, um, and and others who who it has uh, it has been speculated were reacting to something we don't know, some catastrophe. Perhaps you know the the rise of uh, within the context of urbanization, terrible disease. Um, many people have speculated. I don't, I don't think there's an answer, but it seems that that kind of revolution in yoga's history, from one which uh, emphasized societal life, that emphasized family, uh, that emphasized a, a kind of um, um, being together and a sort of ongoingness of uh, continuity of life, we get to one that has uh, as its goal cessation, withdrawal, the ending 
actually of continued existence. Is the point at which we stand about to produce that very first form of yoga again? Will this be one of the consequences of the sixth mass extinction? Do we come to a place where yoga gets its original meaning back, that it becomes a place to confront extreme suffering, of which we're about to see much more? Um, these are, are things that I don't know. Um, but it seems to me that unless we have a, a, a death wish, contemplative practice can't mean quietism at this point. And here I'm speaking just personally. This is, this is my, my feeling, my opinion. And that, that these practices are very useful for dealing with those difficult situations, with despair, and for, in Donna Haraway's words, staying with the trouble, and that they're going to be extremely important. Um, but again, also speaking not as a, as a social scientist or a historian, um, it seems to me that, that what we need to do now is, um, is a massive effort of nonviolent resistance and um, civil disobedience. That's... Uh, what we need to do. So that's uh, where I'm going to leave it. Thank you very much. I, I would. Um, I'm not sure that I, that I could. I could ag agree with that in, entirely. I mean, the the um, well, it seems to me that that hatha yoga is, is intimately linked, as uh, as my my colleague um, over there has, has has very 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 well, Jim has has very has very well demonstrated <laughs> that in fact that in fact we we have a nexus that there there are no breaks. The, there are no watersheds that where you know where you could say that that it, this isn't isn't related to the past. And in the case of, of hatha yoga, um, it's very very clear that that many of the practices are referring back to um, or, or are, are related to ancient practice, ascetic practices, but also to um, much much earlier tantric practices. Um, and so you you have this kind of um, you have this link to the past, even though it's presenting itself as something new. It's, it's all, always sort of, uh, it's always linked, which I think is what you're saying, which I think is your yeah. point. I'm not bothered about the timeline. Yeah. You're saying that in India, or in any, in any uh, substratum, there are multiple thought processes which originate. And just to use the word tying in, yeah. because it ties in, yeah. and then use the word yoga, even if you go back to all of the original texts, mm. I mean, yoga has been used very diffusely. 
Mm -hmm. Even in the Bhagavad Gita, I mean, he uses it, he just ties it in because it's tied to karma, or it's tied to bhakti, or it's tied to yeah. Yeah. but it's really very divergent. Well, the, the, the Gita is, is an interesting example which departs, which sort of makes, makes um, a case for different kinds of yoga. It's sort of, it seems to be sort of trying to um, uh, diversify w w what yoga is. But I think it's also true that the, there's an identifiable continuum of practices, particularly in the second half of the, of the second millennium, so from, you know, this, well, from you know, 14th, 15th, 16th century onwards, that, that really becomes um, identified as y yoga as such, and w which has a lot to do, may maybe I'm, I'm been working on Hatha Yoga too long, but which you know has, has to do with the sort of um, assimilation of, of Hatha Yoga into sort of uh, into the mainstream, into the um, to the orthodox mainstream for one thing, where it had sort of been outside of that, um, but also into sort of householder practice. So I, th I think um, uh, maybe you know the, the, there isn't that that sort of great great diversity in, um, it, in, in the later centuries, at least. It seems to be you get a, you get a fairly steady picture of, of what yoga is. Yeah. Sure. And there. Um, kind of a multi-part question, but if the concept of yoga influencing society where it's in greater practice over time is evolving, then how, how might we see that in the West versus the East? Because for example, when you put up before the, if you, would you actually go ahead and say another one? Another. There was the two different quotes that Stephen Cope was responding to. Oh, yeah. So in some ways, maybe you could say the second one here is a great cause of the caste system itself. So my question is, if we see places where yoga philosophy has been more thoroughly applied on a national scale, has that really been to the development of the caste system, and how could we expect it to be applied on a greater scale in a modern Western society to get yeah. positive outcomes? As yoga, um, well, as, as I say, I think the Bhagavad Gita is, is sort of exceptional. In some ways, it's it's not really a yoga text. There's so much in it. That, I mean, it's not sort of you know, it's not. There's there's sections that talk about about various kinds of yoga, and that there's sections that also sort of teach you how to sit and where to sit and things like that. Um, but in um, with regard to to caste and um, hatha yoga, well, you know the sort of restrictions that you, that you might see on on who who can practice certain things, who can practice certain Vedic rituals, let's say, or who can practice certain tantric rituals, for that matter. Um, in the the sort of the hatha yogic revolution. Uh, there's a kind of um, universalization. There's, there's a kind of op opening out. So some of the some of these texts uh, say that well, everybody's welcome to to practice yoga, no matter what their sectarian affiliation. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, n no matter what their their position in society, it's sort of it's sort of a, a, a floating technology that um, that works no matter what you believe. And um, as as Jim was saying the other night, in, in one of the texts, even the, the these this group called the Charvakas are mentioned, who don't believe in anything. They're materialists, and so which sort of sort of begs the question why they would do yoga in the first place. But there you go. Anybody can do it. So in that sense, um, in that sense, yoga can can sort of uh, adhere to any particular system of thought and any particular ideology, and is in some respects neutral in that regard. Um, but the the ideologies themselves, or, or the the sort of ideas about how society is organised, or you know who you are in that society and what you should do in that society. Yes, I think there's a kind of dialectic, isn't there? There's, there's sort of there's a, a description of, of how society is, which then reinforces a sort of particular view of society. And that, yeah. So it's uh, is, is that that sort of yeah, sort of. Mm? That's right. And that creates a lot of confusion. Yeah. Varna is not something that is based in a genetic genealogy. But caste means, uh, when you say jati, jati means birth. It proceeds according to the, what your genetic genealogy is. But Varna depends on your aptitudes, your qualities, and all that. Yeah. So, where, what is referred 
prefer to hear a select two varana and not to jati, not to genetic lineage, but to uh, you will uh, get up according to what is called sattva rajas tamas. Uh, that is a different, very deep topic. I am not going into it. But it is this confusion is all over the Western translations of this because the two words uh, jati and varana. Uh, get translated as the same thing as caste. So, uh, there was um, maybe Galen. Is anybody able to hear the questions? Because I, I yeah. forgot that we had these microphones. Uh, yeah. It's pretty good. It's yes. okay? Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, so, um, can it? Well, yeah, so uh, in the, I remember at the beginning in the title that you said was obscuring what you were actually going to talk about. There was a figure. Ah, yeah. And I, I feel like it's interesting because I, I feel like the, the dominant narrative that I hear in the West and in the United States about any Eastern traditions that have been brought to here is that they were brought in kind of coercive ways through colonialism, through imperialism. And it seems like in this talk you were kind of countering that narrative and that actually in most of those cases the autonomy and the power was of, of how those traditions were brought over was actually in the hands of Indian practitioners and gurus who came over. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, how, how did the colonial, how did colonial power and imperial power play into how traditions were brought over? Was it yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a huge it's a huge topic. I, I write about it in in certain places. I mean, th there was really um, I mean, there, there was a movement, a colonial movement of uh, the repression of certain yogi castes. Uh, you know, that was that was brutal and, and significant, um, and a kind of um, story told. If we're talk, just talking about yoga, uh, story told about yogis that had a, a very definite and, and sort of traceable effect on the way that subsequent uh, teachers like Swami Vivekananda presented yoga and the yoga tradition. So there, there was sort of, there, there was always a, you know, a kind of, uh, a kind of dialogue of some sort going on, I think, with, with that sort of colonial uh, vision, which was, you know, often um, badly wrong and badly racist. Um, the, um, the, the, oh, it's, 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 such a, it's such a broad topic. I mean, it's, you know, everything, everything is, uh, yeah, everything is, is related there. But it's sort of, it's that, that history also, which I, I think you, you might be referring to, is, um, is very um, present in the sort of contemporary uh, debates and discussions and arguments about, about cultural appropriation and whether, whether yoga has... Um, as practiced in outside outside of India, is is an act of a kind of uh, you know another act of colonial um, sort of you know grabbing what's what's not rightfully uh, what what one doesn't have the right to grab, and so the, this word ad adhikara, you know, this sort of right or authority to to teach and practice yoga, is a very contested term and a sort of term that that also has a you know sort of um, prominent political place these days particularly in, in the discussion of yoga so it's a, it's a very it's a very live topic and it's um, just from, from a sort of you know uh, the point of view of, of uh, social history it's one that that wasn't really around when when I started sort of studying well, as, as prominent when I was started studying this stuff um, where the, the sort of the perennial philosophy I think was was much more present it was like well we're, we're all we're all one, and uh, you know we can all we can all practice this stuff. It's part of the common heritage. And since since uh, over the past ten years or so, it seems to me that there's been a, a hardening or the return of the religious into what was sort of a secular sphere. Um, with, um, for instance, um, certain Christ high profile sort of Christian preachers saying that that yoga yoga is of the devil and that Christians shouldn't practice it with yoga being banned in in uh, certain Muslim countries um, with a with a sort of um, uh, also from from within Hinduism a, a sort of you know as I said I sort of showed one slide there an assertion that yoga is is, uh, is Hindu and should be recognized as, as such and so you, you sort of this this is all going on right now it's it's very it's very live 
um, and it's um, in some respects the the paradigm for that is is um, is is that that old sort of colonial paradigm that, that that's what people are thinking about and that it's like that again. It, I I think that that thing, things have changed. We're, we're no longer in that period of time and. That, um, that that perhaps is not a very helpful way to think about the way that yoga is, is, is transmitted these days. Yeah. Um, slightly on a similar note, but more practical, um, how you were talking a little bit about the Scandinavian exercises, and, and I've heard that before. Yeah. Uh, how did that happen like that makes of, I, I heard British military Ah, but this is, this is really interesting, yeah. Um, how, and, and it seems instrumental because from reading parts of your book, it seems like it wasn't until very late that th this movement was incorporated into yoga. First it was, you know, more meditation, then it was postures, mm. and then the postures started moving. <laughs> yeah. So I'm mm. wondering, could you say more, a, little, a little bit more about that? Well, it, it's not so much so uh, in spite of the, the sort of subtitle of that book, Yoga Body, which is the origins of modern yoga practice. It's, it's never really about origins. It's never about clear origins. There aren't any clear origins. There are, there are just things that go further and further back, as I was, as I was saying earlier. Um, the, uh, the Swedish gymnastics element is, is very interesting and one that I think has been, I've been quite misinterpreted from, from the work that I've done. Um, which is, it's not to say that, uh, that Swedish gymnastics is, you know, was sort of uh, behind modern yoga, but that the t the, those two ways of understanding mov movement and the body sort of merged and came together in various, in various places. Now, the thing that I, that I um, didn't know at that time um, was that the grandfather of, um, of Swedish gymnastics, the one that sort of influenced so many other of the European gymnastics and then, you know, subsequently in other parts of the world, um, he uh, apparently got many of his ideas about gymnastics from Dao Yin, from, uh, from Chinese texts. Which I love. I love that. It's just like you know, you think you think you're sort of at the beginning, and that, that. But it's it's all it's all always already tangled, as uh, you know. Like uh, so, so we have that that layer as well. But that was those sort of um, health gymnastics. Then then also ha have an important part in in the the physical culture history of India, which includes yoga, and which which sort of you know. It, came together, you know, with a sort of discourse of curative gymnastics. So, so yoga becomes um, uh, not that it, not that there's not elements like that in, in tradition, of course, but it becomes a kind of cur curative practices like nature cure and so yeah. But it's uh, you know it's all it's you, you never you never sort of get to the beginning. You know, it's always always tangled up. So uh, yes, I think you were next. In several years. Um, um, for those who have forgotten, the idea of the, you know, we're facing this uh, sixth mass extinction, and where does yoga fit in with that? You know, I've been uh, listening to you <laughs> the last couple of days, and I'm very appreciative. Um, you know, the, the yoga sutras, which is what I'm most familiar with, mm. really seems to me about, to be about personal liberation, reduce the root causes of suffering, yeah. and attain liberation. Um, so you said that yoga's origin was in dealing with social crisis. Possibly, it's, it's a speculation, Possibly yeah. It's a speculation. Mm, mm. So, so is, is it a, a matter of adapting yoga to fit a new paradigm of social crisis. Uh, as, as you've shown, it's been adapted to many other ideas. Um, or is there some root model, some model of yoga in that way, of having been addressing social ills? Mm. I mean, I'm, social ills seem such, so small compared to 
Yeah. The dawn of the Anthropocene. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, I, I don't know. I think, you know, the, the most important thing is to do everything we can and pool our resources to sort of deal with the problem at hand. And then also, it's an open question. I, I don't know. And, and as, you know, sort of a body of contemplative practitioners, I, I think this, this is what we are going to have to uh, address. And as, as to how that looks, um, I, I don't know. As, as to yoga's role in that, if, if any, um, I also don't know. Uh, but I, it's, really, it's really my question to you. <laughs>